We talk an awful lot about collaboration, and I know um, tonight's presentation will highlight many of our community partners, but on a personal level, I wanted to mention that the work we, we are about to see tonight would not have happened without the collaborative spirit and the amazing and incredible level of dedication from all these folks that I see play out in the office every day. So most of you know that the Design Center is a multidisciplinary architecture and urban design firm that's dedicated to creating sustainable places and communities through quality design rooted in a collaborative process. We like to say that it's a, it is modeled after the teaching hospital tradition since it's a unique hybrid between an architectural practice and a teaching studio that engages students directly in their work. You could also say that the Design Center is an applied research center housed within the School of Architecture at UDM. And the distinction of applied research is not inconsequence, inconsequential because every project the Design Center takes on is grounded in the everyday realities of our community. But at the same time, it is also an academic research in the sense that they are working at the cutting edge of our profession and influencing the future of the profession through their work. However, the particular leading edge where they, are, where they work is not focused on the avant-garde for the sake of stylistic novelty. Instead, their work is grounded by the traditions of the Jesuit and Mercy philosophies that constantly remind us that the aspirations and dreams that we have the privilege to help nourish in our clients are always guided by our shared hope for social justice, progressive equity, and the promise of a vibrant physical landscape where we all can flourish together. This process is based on the premise that the future of any neighborhood or district lies in the hands of its, its residents and local organizations. That doesn't mean that we simply listen to local constituents and solicit their opinions in the tradition of mandated public input, but instead, like any architect really should in an ideal world, we work hand in hand as co-authors with our community partners. In fact, in the last 20 years, the Design Center has partnered with over 90 nonprofit organizations, community groups, and government agencies. And that, I would say, is actually a conservative estimate if you consider the number of groups that we have partnered with in the recent citywide Detroit Future City project. The work of DCDC has been published widely and won numerous awards, including the 2002 and 2009 NCARB prizes and the 2009 Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Design Excellence for their St. Joseph's Rebuild Center in New Orleans. Their work has been exhibited widely on numerous occasions in many venues, including the Venice Biennale. And most recently, I'm proud to announce that the DCDC was one of only six recipients globally of the 2014 Seed Award for Excellence in Public Interest Design for its community how-to guides. Of course, they have enjoyed many, many other accolades, but I know we are all anxious to hear about their work in their own words. So please join me in welcoming Dan, Charles, and Virginia. And thank you, Will, once again. OK, for those who weren't standing, all those people up there are people who've been in the Design Center before and who have made, have made us who we are today. I really needed to acknowledge that. And these are the people who are there now, just making sure that we constantly remember that you see three of us speaking. Sometimes you might only see Virginia, you might only see Charles or myself or Christina who's in the back, but it's really all of us that make this happen. It, it's the same for any architecture office, landscape or urban design office. So we are here to talk about syncopating Detroit, more people, more programs, and more geographies. To do that, we're gonna essentially cover the whole thing by talking about verbs. And I'll explain this a little bit in, towards the beginning. Uh, but it's the whole structure of the lecture is 10 verbs. A Couple times we triple up and double up in one point, so there may be more like 15, but there are about 10 verbs that we then will describe the work and think through the work with you. 
Then we're going to talk about projects, but we can't talk about projects alone. That's not the way we operate. They connect to bigger visions, bigger strategies, and how we think about work. Connecting transactional issues to or transactional work into transformative systems. And then lastly, we're going to talk about where we're going, and that's really about a five-minute um, piece at the end. I will be starting here. Charles and Virginia will be, um, chime in, be presenting here, and I will come in at the, at the last five minutes. Syncopating. The reason why we looked at the word syncopation is it's a music term. First, because it's a music term, and Detroit is famous for the variety of music. If you've seen the exhibit, it, it discusses this on the very first panel. But it also is a specific musical, musical term that takes things that are the stronger, more dominant notes and makes them weaker, and then the weaker notes become more dominant. And I'm oversimplifying for the sake of brevity here. But you could say that that's something that's been happening in Detroit organically for decades. How do we now shift that and begin to say, if that's happening organically, our stronger, more um, dominant notes have been shifting, and within the community, within small business, within the world around Detroit, other notes are becoming stronger. How do we actually celebrate that? Celebrate the work in neighborhoods, celebrate the businesses that are happening, and redefine this, uh, the system of Detroit through the system that's already been developing, uh, the music that's already been developing from communities and neighborhoods around the city. That's, the, that's why we chose that word, uh, syncopation. So quick, I, only, I just wanted to make sure we covered this, that we are teaching hospital, as Will said. I don't want to necessarily get more detail, but this is us. And 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started, we filled this corner. There was like three of us, Andy, Christina, um, Chris, and myself, four of us. Here we are now. And I, I love Julia actually put this together. Um, you see that. Uh, Carlos loves martial arts down there. I've learned a lot about people too, even on all this. But tonight, Charles there will be speaking, Virginia, as we've said, and myself. Want to make another point that Will has made at the introduction. We truly believe that we are, if you will, blending. We not believe we're operating, we're blending the profession and the academia together. How do we find a model that doesn't have lines between the professional world and the academic world, but blurs and brings them together? That's what actually we won the, ver the grand prize, the very first NCAR prize in 2002 because of that we were shown that we were the one instant in the country where that really has occurred in the, from, the, from the academic standpoint. Three things that govern how we operate. We have to work with intensive community participation. We have to. That to us, as Will also mentioned in the intro, we, if we do not have robust and meaningful and transparent civic engagement, it will not thrive in the future. Whatever that it may be, citywide work, a work on the block or, or, or a lot that has to have civic participation. We also, though, don't believe that we actually, I was taught in school, now it was many years ago, the early 1980s, that if you did this, you couldn't do this. If you did civic engagement, you had to forget about good design, you're going to get mediocre stuff and all that sort of, you had to abandon the tools of your discipline. And we believe that we are truly not doing that. What's really happening is that we're creating the content for design versus validating what we've already thought. So the work here is that there really are, there, there, it's a both and as opposed to either or. Civic engagement brings things together. And then lastly, particularly in cities like Detroit, um, legacy cities as they're being called now, that we are not concerned with building buildings alone, we're concerned with the built environment. That we have to be thinking about everything that creates the built environment. As architects, we always do that, but now the solutions that we're thinking are solutions that may, may include a building or may not include a building. And we have to constantly keep ourselves and uh, remind ourselves of that. Our office has planners, architects, 
landscape architects, and urban designers. So we have all four built in professions in an office of as small as you see here, because we, we feel very strongly about that condition. We break our projects down in more detail, the actual many projects are in the exhibit. I just wanted to go over a few of them. So then, and then we're gonna, and then Charles and Virginia are gonna dive in, a, in, in with more detail in a couple. We break them down to three parts. Neighborhood spaces, neighborhood strategies, and neighborhood catalysts. In neighborhood spaces, that's sort of what we might consider more like architecture and landscape architecture. They're the spaces that people do uh, interact with day in and day out. It's where stories are told. We, lo we love to think about what we're designing as we're creating the places where stories are made. This is the Rebuild Center, St. Joseph Rebuild Center. It's a homeless center in New Orleans. It takes about a third of a city block, and this is the one that did get the um, Rudy Bruner Award. It actually also got, um, just recently, the Daedalo Minose, an international prize in um, Italy. This is the inside of this. It's in New Orleans, so it could be mostly open. This took care of five organizations that were um, that lost our headquarters after the flood, and um, we're doing now. Then we're brought together. Homeboy Industries in um, L.A. This was um, their headquarters. Also received the De Luminosa in 2002. Neighborhood Strategies. That's really more of the overall neighborhood um, design, if you will, urban design, if you want. But it's where we connect the dots between the neighborhood spaces, make meaningful connections between one transactional event and another. One that we're working on is Bloody Run, which grew out of many types of uh, war, uh, uh, many years of work over since the um, late 70s and early 80s, but really came to a condition in the 90s with the community reinvestment strategy in Detroit, where this area said, as, as, as we develop, we want to see unearthing of a creek. So we were brought in a few years back to do a study of how can that actually happen. Now we're working specifically on uh, on stormwater management to start doing a couple projects that are very small and discreet that help define how this could develop into a bigger strategy. An image of what that could look like. We're architects, we love doing sections. Neighborhood catalysts. Our strategies blur. Because many of these will be somewhat, well, aren't they spaces? Yes, they are. They're, well, these are the things that are maybe the bit more unusual things that connect the community into acting or engaging differently than uh, more conventional projects. So for example, here are four empty lots in the city of Detroit. We're showing that you can take, and this grew out of a master plan that we were doing in the area, Take that building there, which is an abandoned house, and turn it into a band shell for an amphitheater. Yes, it's a space. Yes, this is a landscape. But now, the way community will engage with that, the way community will see that become a part of that is very different in terms of what normal spaces will be and how they begin to see the trans, how we oftentimes hear about blight has to be removed. Well, blight, yes, has to be, but does that mean that it just has to be demolished, or can we have creative ways to work with blight and form strategies and projects that are completely unique to the city of Detroit? Um, overhead view of that. TAP, the alley project in southwest Detroit. The alley is a graffiti gallery. Actually, a class um, uh, taught by Will um, Ardeen, Will Wittig, and uh, about eight students with youth from the community built the interior of the garage that you just saw with the yellow mural on it. The, across from that are two empty lots that become a training area for, uh, for the youth to learn graffiti art. So essentially, it's a gang prevention uh, activity. We hope that in the work we're doing, we're doing this, the next verbs. Reveal and instigate. Reveal the hidden histories of a place and instigate future traditions. 
How do we begin to do that? Not directly, not saying this will be the tradition, but create the places. If we're creating places where stories are made, then we can, through those stories, create the places that traditions are made. Beginning to do that is to celebrate assets that we have, the things that exist. We don't need to start from scratch. Many of those assets may be hidden, but this is what make any city unique, is finding those hidden assets. Things like the, uh, assets come from, in our minds, in two ways, two places, people and the environment. People make music, for example, and we live near a river. Things like this are very easy. Henry Ford worked there, did his internship there, so we should celebrate that. You know, George Washington slept here, all those sort of things. That, that's easy. Things like this are less easy. We had a working landscape in our waterfront. It's a beautiful waterfront now, don't get me wrong, it's beautiful, but things like this could have, been tra could have transformed the waterfront in a way that was particularly unique to the city. Those are um, the silos, that instead of perhaps demolishing them, they could have become sound chambers that celebrated the music of Detroit. So you walk into one and hear techno playing and reverberating, hear Motown, because we have to have Motown, we're in Detroit, right? Jazz, hip hop, and they can rotate. The Peacemaker Garden, using another example of using an empty building in a creative way. And then again, the Playhouse. All of that essentially in our mind revolves around two things that create one. Cities are made of people and people make their cities. They cannot be separated. Cities are, cannot be defined without understanding people and their relationship to the place. To understand that then, then we say, well, there's two things that, may, uh, that we do in our analysis and our work. We have to understand through civic engagement, together co-authoring, working, partnering. We have to together work towards the understanding the, the people and then understanding the urban analysis, the urban place. So that leads us right now, now we, we could talk about the urban condition, but that leads us to civic engagement. And I want to talk a bit about that. What does that mean? We like to talk about civic engagement in relationship to mosaics and tapestries. So a few of you may have heard me say this before. The what, reason why we use the, the condition mosaic or the idea of mosaic is that in a mosaic, each tile can be unique while still creating a bigger image, a bigger um, um, view, if you will. So each person in a community can be unique while creating a bigger community. We don't have to sacrifice one or the other. Oftentimes we hear that. With that said, then we say that, okay, this is the formula, if you will. You should have a, maybe say a plus sign there and an equal sign there, is that people that are talking together, working together, will move forward together. And that may fly in the face to some people. When they hear the word civic engagement, they hear this. They immediately say, whoa got to stop, you want to stop something from happening. And yes, that's true. Civic engagement is used to stop things. That's, and it's, and rightly so, the times when that is very important to do. But it is also something that can create things. Very, very important. It is also something that doesn't just happen in planning, but happens in action too. We can make, literally make physical things. If you're doing all that, then you need to think about relationships. What engagement is, isn't about gathering information, it's about, get, it's about getting into a relationship, building relationships, and together working, together talking, and together moving forward. To make a giant leap, if we're doing that, we think of this in two ways. We really think about, how do, what are the variety of ways of bringing people into the process? We must be invited into the process first. If a community wants us to be, a, wants a design, they come to us and we must be invited into a process. But then when that's happened, we talk, how do we get people to not just come to another meeting? How do we become creative in that? But then also, once you're now created all these variety of ways to bring people into the process, what do you do when they're there? How do we make that participation meaningful? I want to show first some ideas that we've used very quickly um, uh, on how we actually do our process of 
making the participation meaningful. Two things. One is we don't actually ask people to talk about nouns. We ask about verbs. We say, tell us the verbs of things. We don't want to hear bus stop. We want to hear welcoming, resting, waiting. These are the verbs, and we're designing for them, not for the noun. So another good example would be if I asked everyone in this room to think of a stair, which is a noun. Everyone's stair will probably be different. Many might choose the stair you just came up here. But if I ask you to think of ascending and descending, I, the, the, the ideas expand. They become greater. That's key. Ascending and descending widens the opportunity to design. And here are some ac action shots, if you will, of us with tap, marking the landscape with verbs. Maybe a bit more traditionally, but we love doing this as well, working with plans. Playing, sitting. This is not us writing, this is the variety of stakeholders writing. What we like to call spatial dough. This is a video. When the initial building program is determined, stakeholders identify the spatial relationships and adjacencies. Play dough represents programs, room areas, and volumes. Yeah, that's my <laughs> office here in Nepo. Oh, well, then let me get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> probably be somewhere over on okay. Either there or maybe by the Parent Resource Center. I thought the Parent Resource Center, but I don't want to be right next to the child care. And I, not that I don't like kids. <laughs> Do you want to be upstairs? How about upstairs? Be upstairs? Yeah, that'll work. Here. <laughs> Put her upstairs. Put her upstairs. No. Put her upstairs. But understand that all these things that we have listed aren't going to be going on at the exact same time. Right. So some of these rooms are going to be sharing. Actually, he, said, he says sharing time and space. Sorry about that. Um, that's our meeting for us, which is so much more ex um, exciting to be involved with. People get, you can see it's a much more fun. We say we're building partners, not clients. It's, we're partnerships in this. Our processes are designing methods that promote the uh, in spontaneity of idea sharing. It's really the process is not trying to get to a particular point, right? It's trying to create a, uh, the environment where ideas can be shared and design will come from. Then I just wanted to briefly show a couple quick things on the tactics we use to bring people into a dialogue, and particularly what we used for Detroit Works Project, which became Detroit Future City. This is a map of a year-long process from November 2011 to November 2012, the variety of things. Oftentimes when I talk to people about what we did, they assume we started something, we stopped, we started again, we stopped. But this begins to show that things were happening simultaneously. Everything from doing a Detroit Stories, which was an oral history project, if you go to the DetroitStoriesProject.com, you'll see something like this. It's the, the page is actually a little bit different now. It's more vertical. We ran an online gaming opportunity, Detroit 24-7. We did a thing called the roaming table. The roaming table would pop up three to four times a week for three to four hours each into in front of a bus stop, in front of a school, and so on. We had music videos. I'm only going to play a brief section of this just to give a sense. Oh, sorry. Oh, well. That's okay. <laughs> I'm rushing myself too much there. All of that led to this. Bringing people into the conversation. Not everyone goes to meetings, right? Nobody would, it, it, me, me, people that are 18, 25, they don't want to go to meetings. We were able to interact with people in Detroit 163,000 times. We had 30,700 one-on-one conversations with people. And I'm going to end with this, and I'm going to give it to Charles. And all of that's great. But if you don't have a clear understanding of what the group, the, the community, city, leaders, their definition of transparency, you can fall into this. That if people hear nothing, 
they think everything. And there could be the things that go through people's minds when, they've, when they're thinking be, um, that you're, uh, the conspiracies, and, and sometimes they're true, yes. But we need to be very clear of what transparency means. And so oftentimes we'll hear, we got it, let people understand the milestones, that's great. But we need to also connect beyond milestones, the space between major events, there needs to be a connection, a transparency, a dialogue. And if you're truly doing that exchange, the dialogue will be present. It's not something that happens just in the media. It happens naturally and organically if you set up some of the processes that we've shown. So now I'm gonna hand it to Charles. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, um, three things, and one part is engage, uh, engage community, and Dan kind of set that up real nice for me, um, because I spent about 90% uh, of my time over the last couple of years engaging community through the Detroit Works um, long-term planning. Um, one of the things we uh, always talk about when we were um, developing that whole process was actually who is the community? Who are we talking to? What, what, and, and so, you know, you have business owners and you have people who are just residents and people who work for the government and people who, have, uh, who are involved with um, uh, faith-based organizations and nonprofits. And so you have this whole, once again, this whole mosaic and there are others beyond this. But as Dan said before, he talked about mosaics, right? And so when you have a mosaic of people, uh, you have to have a mosaic of tactics. And I think that's one of the, the great things that we did with this, and Dan just showed that, was that we had this whole series of different ways to engage people uh, differently. So we're, we're trying to meet them where they're at and talk to them in a way that, they, that they'll, they'll understand better and that they can connect with better. So when we, when we look at en engage and how do we engage and understanding community, um, this whole thing is about blending of expertise. So we're, all, we're looking at blending the professional expertise of the architects and landscape architects and the planners, and they bring something to the table. But the people in the community bring something to the table as well, and they're experts in their neighborhood. So whatever the project is, the, 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 where those two come together where it says Detroit's future, that was for that particular project, but that's for whatever the project is. That's the neighborhood's future. You know, that's that building's future comes together where those two uh, meet. And so the ways that we engage community happens a lot differently um, in different situations. So with Detroit Future City or, or Detroit Works, we did all of those different tactics. We were able to connect with all those people. Um, I'll show you next an image uh, from one of those meetings. And I went to close to 10,000 meetings. Um, and so out of that came a lot of different information. People were very forthgiving of themselves. Um, they gave us more information than you, you could understand. And we had to have a very robust way to manage that information. Through G actually, we ended up using GIS to manage the comments that came. So we could then go to the professional team the, 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 who, have, who are bringing that expertise, and if they're working on a particular neighborhood or a particular zip code, we can then go and pull up the comments from those particular meetings and be able to explain, here's what the people in this neighborhood have said are the issues that they need uh, uh, to have um, and that they would like to see addressed, and, and here's some of the ideas they have. And so that was an idea, uh, one way that we managed a lot of information, I mean thousands and thousands of comments uh, that we were able to um, pull out of these meetings and be able to have that dialogue um, as well with the community. Here's another um, where we engaged um, a series of stakeholders from the, uh, in through the Detroit Works Project where they had to go up and make some decisions on certain things and, and pick and, and prioritize. And, and this is an important exercise because you have to, you, 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 you can't pick everything. 
right? Everything, you, don't, you get, don't get the opportunity to say, every single one of these, you have to give certain weight to some of those. And that elevates those and makes a, a situation where you have um, a, a prioritized information from the community where they can, you can help understand where the community really sees the problems in their neighborhood. We also had open house events at the home base, and this was one of them where we opened the doors up and we have people come in for our, we stayed open for hours and hours and hours. Um, makes for a long day, but it, it's nice because we did these in a, situ in a way that allowed people, you know, if you can't make it to your community meeting, maybe you can stop off after work and, and come voice your opinion here. And you can come here about um, the environmental piece uh, of the work that's going on or whatever, the, the neighborhood piece or whatever the different pieces of the work. Um, we hosted a, um, a, an open house featuring each one of those pieces of the work. So you could come on whichever days or you could come to any of them and still, you know, interact and, and talk to someone. And once again, um, as Dan mentioned earlier, we talked about, um, we did this um, uh, Detroit 24-7, an online gaming situation where uh, people were able to come sign up, put their information in, and then and when we launched this game at midnight, people were online playing this game where you go through a whole series of um, situations. You're given a series of scenarios and how you would react in some of those scenarios, but you also had the chance to post pictures of your favorite place in Detroit or to um, uh, post information about your favorite restaurant or whatever it may be. And what happened was uh, someone was playing this game the entire time it was up for the entire three weeks till they shut the game down. Someone was constantly online playing that game. Um, and I think that was really interesting because we had a community conversation meeting and people were coming in and talking and there was a kid on the side with his laptop playing the game at the same time at the meeting. Um, and so this gave people another format who couldn't make it out to the community meetings or who didn't have the time. Uh, and, and we also had a lot of youth and this was another way to collect information uh, from the youth and start allowing them to have dialogue with other people throughout the city, which was really interesting to see how they, you know, they put something up about, well, why does this have to happen? And someone who might be a city employee might say, well, well, that's because this, this, and this, and if we had better, you know, situation in management or whatever the situation is. And so this started a dialogue between people who may never talk any other time. Now I'm skipping to uh, a project uh, called Recovery Park. And this is um, when we did uh, some of the community engagement where we actually brought out images and graphics and allowed the community to put information down to kind of give us their feedback on the different ideas they had and the different things that they'd like to see happen in that community as part of Recovery Park. So this was one of the meetings at um, one of the churches in the community. Here's a, one of the open house events that we held where people can come in, ask questions. We had a full-size model uh, where we kind of explained that this was not about uh, a, a, a project taking up all the land, but working only on um, spaces that were city-owned and, and vacant and abandoned. And here's some other photos from that same meeting. Now this is also from Recovery Park, and this is a stakeholder meeting with uh, some of the 120 organizations that got involved. So we, we went from you know, uh, talking with the community and understanding what the needs of the community were, um, but also to dealing with stakeholders and people who wanted to be a part of this leadership task force, which was a whole, like I said, 120 different organizations were involved and it made for a very robust and, and very, um, a situation where we had to think quickly on our feet because sometimes someone may bring something up and while we have a certain agenda we're trying to work through because we design these engagements, each one is different. These are designed, so we don't only design spaces, we also design the engagement that happens. And in one of these meetings, a, a, a red flag came up. Someone brought something up that no one thought about. We stopped the meeting, we huddled, we said, okay, we'll stop today and we'll, we'll take this into consideration. And we went back and reworked the next series of workshops um, based on one of the things that came up. 
and so sometimes that's what you have to do um, when, you're, when you're in those types of situations. So based on that engagement and some of the stakeholder meetings and the discussions we had, we found out that, guess what? There's a blues jam that happens out here every Sunday and about you know, somewhere between five and 900 people come out and they listen to blues and they play blues. And the story behind this is that there was an old guy named John and they call it John's Carpet House. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. And that used to be the blues after our spot. Well, John passed away, the house was demolished, but his buddies uh, go every weekend and clean up the lot. And that's Big Pete. That's not his real name, but that's what they call him, Big Pete. And Big Pete runs the whole thing, and he passes the bucket, and everybody throws a $5 bill in, and they put gas in the generator and put gas in the lawnmowers, and they keep it going. And so this is something they do every uh, Sunday. So when it gets nice out, over on St. Alban and Frederick, um, you can go to what they call John's Carpet House or Big Pete's Place. And, and so, but that came out of engagement. That's how we found out about that is that we engage the community and, and that's where you find those assets. And, and, you know, and the little guy who fell asleep in the middle of the blues jam. Um, and so, but that's just a, another way that we think about these things and that we have to move through and we find those assets through that engagement. So now I'm gonna talk uh, about connecting dots and I'm gonna kind of zoom around a couple, little pla couple places here, but um, one of the things as part of uh, Detroit Works uh, long-term planning, and uh, which is now um, Detroit Future City, I ended up going to a lot of the meetings and people came back to me or called back and said, listen, you know, that thing you were talking about, I, you know, my church, we'd like to get involved in that. So I, it was about me trying to help connect people to different resources. So what it was almost like was a series of, you take a handful of stones and throw them into the pond, and creating a series of ripples. And sometimes the ripples come in on each other. And so sometimes you have these connections, right? And some, some not so much and some more so. Um, and that's how a lot of these things ended up happening um, with the community where I had discussions with people. I went to a neighborhood meeting. I spoke. Pastor said, hey, would you come to my church? I go to his church. Then a couple days later, I get called by a block club in that same neighborhood. Then a, a guy from another community association in that same area calls. And I look at the map and I say, they're all right in the same area. Let's all have a meeting. Where we, so now we've started meeting at Pastor Bell's church over on the east side. And now, even though they decided, hey, we, it's better maybe if we don't work together, but we, we meet together because we have some similar interests. But I'm going to take what I've got here and go back to my neighborhood he, one person said, well, we're going to take this back to our block club. The pastor said, in my neighborhood, we're going to start working on some things. Now, it's, it, there's been some movement, and so there's things happening now based on bringing all those people together. So I, now I'm going to kind of slip back to engagement for a minute, but connecting, because I want to talk about how those ripples happen, but then I'm also going to talk about some of the other connections. So here's uh, a group of uh, youth as part of the uh, Young Nation and the TAP Gallery that Dan showed earlier. So this was the meeting at the community center. So we were at the community center, then we walked through the neighborhood, and then we went to the alley, and then made decisions, and the students and the young people made decisions on some of the things that they'd like to see and wear in that alley as part of that alley project. So it's, it's also what is that connection from that community center to that space and how we get there and, and moving along that, that path that gets you there. And so they came out and put, their, put the information down and, and sketched and it started raining, but that's okay. Um, and people put down what they wanted to see and, and, and how they felt about certain things. Now I'm gonna talk a little more about physical connections and this was a map done uh, okay. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we talk about too in, in um, connecting dots, right, 
is where are there opportunities uh, for, for things to happen when you have think, uh, nodes, nodes of, of engagement or nodes that, where you have a crossing. So you, as you see Grand River Avenue and the Greenway crossing there, where the Greenway crosses Grand River, there's an opportunity there. That's, and so it's not just about the dot, but it's the, the path you take to get to the next dot and that experience you have as you're going to that next dot, whether it's below grade, on grade, or whether you're, you're crossing bridges and looking at what that experience is as you move to that next dot. What does that hold? You know, when you're, you're dealing with a series of vacant areas, areas with vacant lots, how do you move through those and, and reimagine what those could be uh, as connecting you as, as you move through and onto that next dot? So lastly, I'm going to talk about um, uh, reveal and how do we reveal opportunities in working through that process of engagement and then connecting dots we, that then helps us to be able to reveal opportunities. So this is, a, a, once again, the Recovery Park neighborhood and it's really hard to see but there are these lines cutting and crisscrossing through. These are ways of movement that people walk on, desiring lines, where people walk and cut through, where they've worn a path into the fields and into the vacant lots. So that was very important when we looked at not just the transportation, but how do people move? How do people traverse and, and get from one place to another? Once again, like we talked about connecting, but now we're going to be talking about how can we reveal opportunities and maybe possibly developing a greenway that will help kind of stitch as uh, stitch the whole the whole piece together and uh, Virginia's going to talk more about stitching but this is where we can start thinking about opportunities where are there opportunities to do different things based around urban agriculture and but also keeping an op opportunity to to allow people to move through that area so part of that which was developed was a master plan but showing opportunities for urban agriculture, green space that people can use. So taking a space like this in an open field, starting out to make it like this where people can still pass and move through, also creating a small node there that people could stop off. Maybe you have a picnic, maybe you have, you know, maybe you have uh, outdoor classrooms, and that eventually can be you know, still used by the community as part of a, a, a way of moving through that neighborhood based on those desiring lines. Once again, another, uh, you know, another uh, area in this uh, Recovery Park project that looks at, you know, we, we've got this open space. We've got a, an opportunity here to start looking at um, um, productive landscapes. How can we make the landscape productive, make it a situation where the landscape can produce something, right? I, earlier I showed you the, the John's Carpet House. Those vacant lots are producing culture. They're producing music, right? And that's one thing we make well here in Detroit. So how can we take vacant land and also produce uh, a situation where we can produce jobs, where the, what we produce from the land then provides a situation where people can have jobs actually grow, not just growing food, but actually creating a food system where this is at the front end, where you create your raw material here and then it goes into a product. Once again, another, you know, looking at, at a building. What can, what can, how can that be looked at? How can we reveal the opportunities in that building to possibly create a, a, a space where you can actually grow fish, where you can grow food, where you can produce something? Once again, that productive landscape. Uh, here's another project over on uh, Woodward where we can say, you know, where, 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 what kind of opportunities would this, this, some, a place like this have? And where we could look at treating, treating stormwater and bioswales, uh, creating transit and biking opportunities, creating opportunities for people to eat outdoors, and also through um, different interventions, acknowledge the history and the, uh, the history of Woodward Avenue through the different banners and signage and the different designations that are already um, on uh, Woodward Avenue. And from there, I will turn it over to Virginia. 
most recently, or over the years rather, we have found that in our projects and in, in our communities, there are oftentimes multiple projects, initiatives going on simultaneously that aren't always connected or what we call stitched together. So in 2011, um, the Design Center started an initiative called Impact Detroit, which is intended to better stitch partners and initiatives together. So it's trying to bridge long-term plans with on-the-ground actions to speed up outcomes for a project. And it does this by pairing um, resources like funding or expertise of individuals with capacity, capacity being um, community organizations, um, community groups, professionals. And pairing these more intentionally to collaborate and actually implement community development projects. Um, so in doing so, um, Impact Detroit is really trying to provide comprehensive community development services through a multidisciplinary team approach. And so, you know, combining disciplines like graphic design, architecture, social work, academic research, all in a collaborative hub to really start to implement holistic design and community development projects. So this is some thinking we've been doing the last couple of years, and we've had the opportunity to um, test it and work with um, the Livernois community in our backyard, the Livernois Corridor, um, to further this Impact Detroit initiative. So if you've been to our campus, you might be familiar, hopefully, with the Livernois Corridor. Um, uh, the area that we've been working in uh, ranges from uh, the Lodge to Eight Mile. Livernois on this map is shown in yellow, and we're in the northwest part of the city, if you're not familiar. And there are a range of, um, you know, neighborhoods in the area, UDM, uh, in the and we've been really privileged to work in this community the last couple years. A lot of the corridor looks like this. There's, there are gaps in the, the housing, the, in the building stock. There, um, there's some vacancy for sure. Um, but a lot of Livernois looks like this. Intact storefronts, potentially very walkable. Um, you know, kind of a Main Street feel at moments. Um, so it has a lot of potential, and with a grant that we received from the Cerdna Foundation, we had an opportunity to engage the corridor and activate it in some way through a project that um, we at Cerdna helped and the community helped conceive. So, you know, I talk about things going on simultaneously but not necessarily stitched together. So when we um, started working more intentionally in the Livernoy Corridor, we were working, there was a Livernois working group that had formed, which was a partnership between Marygrove, UDM, and the city of Detroit, and University Commons organization. Of course, the Livernois business community was active, University Commons, but these things, these initiatives weren't necessarily being stitched together. Uh, this is the Livernois working group taking a tour of the corridor. Um, and also talking about stitching together, our students in the School of Architecture were becoming increasingly interested in impacting their neighborhood, their backyard at the university. So um, students like Master of Community Development students um, were engaging the neighborhood across the street, the Fitzgerald neighborhood, and really trying to listen to their concerns and um, help them form actually a block club. Um, and that work then folded into the uh, award-winning community how-to guides that, that Will spoke of. So um, there are a lot of things going on at once. These how-to guides were developed to address some of the gaps going on in the community and provide usable tools that people could use to push some of these projects forward and know how to negotiate some of the red tape and some of the processes of the city. Um, so, you know, this group actually set up a block club, and in listening to them, we were able to um, create some of these toolkits. Um, 
So there is, there's the MCD capstone team, there's the Livernoy working group. Um, our architecture students also became increasingly interested in Livernoy. Um, we hosted or um, taught a design center-led Livernoy studio in 2011 with architecture students. And, and you know, architecture students, they, they engaged in so many ways through um, service projects on the corridor, um, through streetscape and new programming ideas for the corridor. Um, and all of this was kind of culminated into a book and an exhibit, which really started to capture the imagination of the community. And I think what came out of that studio most was the idea that, um, you know, wow, this, these are great ideas. There's hope. Um, there's great possibility. Um, we had an exhibit that really highlighted the students' work, and, and a lot of people came and were just really refreshed to see the kind of level of imagination that could be possible. So Impact Detroit is really about trying to stitch together and connect all of these initiatives. So, so we were doing this. This is all great, but you know, we wanted to do more. We actually wanted to build something. We wanted to build something. We wanted to continue to build capacity. Um, so, you know, in comes the community storefront. Um, the Livernoy community storefront. So, um, we saw that we needed faster and more real-time engagement that could result in something evident and tangible, a built space the Livernoy Community Storefront. So we were able to rent a vacant storefront between two um, thriving, successful businesses on the Avenue of Fashion around Seven Mile and Livernoy. And we cleaned it up. We minimally um, invested in it. We, uh, we designed some components on the inside. Um, the idea, it was a pop-up, but we weren't necessarily gonna be running it as a pop-up to sell goods. We were running it as a pop-up to um, have a community space and a place for interaction and a place to engage. So, you know, while our design center's traditional engagement tactics, such as our workshop process, um, they do reap results in their own right, but making the engagement actionable through building something, I think has become a critical point in the work since I've been at the Design Center, um, though it's been done all along. <laughs> um, but we're finding that through building something like the storefront, um, our project in and of itself becomes a mode of engagement um, and a mode to collect information and interact with the community. So this is Sierra having a conversation with a community member who probably just walked in asking what was going on. We designed a community calendar. We designed and implemented um, a map of the Livernoy corridor that highlighted every business at the time that was active and open on the corridor. Um, this also resulted in a light up Livernoy event last spring and summer, which was just this great um, celebratory event to promote the corridor and the businesses on the corridor. Um, you know, again, just being at the storefront and being inhabiting the space became a mode for interaction and engagement, which was a great opportunity and learning experience. Um, and we were able to host um, a range of activities in the space and program the space. Um, it's still being programmed intermittently. Um, felting workshops, pottery, paint your own pottery workshops. Um, a Beauty and the Bees production was put on in the space, which my daughter particularly enjoyed. Um, I'm paying for it now with a lot of Disney fanaticism. Um, and then, I, as far as I know, this was the first project that the Design Center really used social media to engage um, the community. And we, we set up and managed and continue to manage the, Liver, the Livernoy Community Storefront Facebook page, 
which has really become a portal to advertise and promote all things great going on Livernoy and um, let people know what's going on in the storefront as well as otherwise. So, you know, we've started to extend our engagement arm through social media. And all of this was, um, this, the stage was set for a lot of this work through our interaction and our collaboration with Challenge Detroit. So I, t I talked earlier about these multidisciplinary teams coming together through Impact Detroit to make these projects possible. Early on, before the storefront was constructed, we partnered with Challenge Detroit. They helped us um, look at all of these different disciplines and add capacity to the storefront project. So we, Challenge Detroit fellows, um, helped us think about economic development on the corridor, event planning. Um, it was a great collaboration. They helped us develop um, an identity and an image for the corridor, including um, a logo. And, and anyway, we just had a really fun time working with them. And it was a, a great experience. Um, and um, I'm finally going to talk about the plug-in and pile-on verb or process that we go through. So plugging in and piling on is really about plugging into the existing initiatives that are happening and really piling on a lot of partners and resources and leveraging the momentum that's going. So um, Livernoy um, Soup began as to build on the momentum that had started. Um, we Detroit Soup saw the engagement that was happening in the community and um, thought it would be a great idea to extend their um, fundraising, microfunding soup dinners to the corridor. So those still go on. I think there's one tomorrow night, actually, on um, the Livernoy Corridor. If you're interested in going, you can look on the website. Um, and then the momentum kind of kept piling on through additional partners. So the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation's Revolve Initiative was awarded a $200,000 Art Place grant last spring to um, activate an additional 10 um, retail and public spaces on the corridor. So um, there was this competition of entries of ideas of how these spaces could be activated. The community was able to chime in. There was an advisory board to help select the winners. Um, the winners were announced and the, the spaces were celebrated in September at the Detroit Design Festival's um, uh, event in September. So again, plugging in and piling on partnerships and building on the momentum. We had no idea that we'd be working with DDF when we started this project, um, but a good thing started coming and we were able to combine resources and, and, and keep the momentum going. So these are some shots from the DDF. Um, some permanent businesses came out of that competition like Art in Motion and it, it's really implemented some transformation on the corridor. Um, so again, this is kind of um, a menu of the partners and initiatives that continue to be active on the corridor that are piling on, per se. Um, and then Impact Detroit is not just working on the Livernoy Corridor, but um, this is Rebecca, a current employee and also collaborator and partner. Um, Impact Detroit um, is trying to support other emerging organizations such as Rebecca's Bleeding Heart Design Organization. And again, in the fall, we were able to work with Challenge Detroit to help further some of Rebecca's goals for her organization, um, which is based in the Linwood Gardens community in the State Fair area. So again, an event was held and a design art intervention was installed. Um, so I'm gonna end my little portion with a couple of quotes um, that I think really illustrate this notion of plugging in and piling on. Um, Model D ran a couple of great stories on the storefront last summer and Claire Nelson said some things really well. Um, the secret to something like the storefront is layers, layers upon layers of partnerships and investment, 
all pointed towards the same shared audacious idea that the Avenue's days, best days, are not bygone, but ahead. And additionally, she said, um, what can you do to help accelerate this movement? Plug in and pile on to places with good bones, strong anchors, and passionate leaders. It takes a little imagination, a lot of cooperation, and that delicate combination of urgency and patience, which I think is right on and is very key to the work we do. So um, Claire said it best. <laughs> so thank you. So where do we go from here? I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about this. I think it's important because we are supposed to be reflecting on our 20th anniversary, if you will. Where do we go from here? Will it be more of the same? That's the question that we constantly are asking. Well, you know, you've done all this. Should it be more of the same? Our answer is yes, but we're going to turn it up a bit. For those who may have saw Spinal Tap looking for that elusive 11 on a dial that only goes to 10, we're looking for turning this thing up a bit more. How do we find more layers, more partnerships, connections in ways? Two examples of where we want to turn it up is in this. We want to do more work. We want to do that work in relationship to these sort of on the ground projects that both Charles and Virginia have shown. Some of those real quick examples that I showed at the beginning, more of that. We want to connect that work to Detroit Future City, saying that, okay, that this was a great framework. We're very proud to have been a part of that. And now how do we drill that framework down into neighborhoods so people can see difference and change in their backyard, and they're a part of that difference and change. And then second, we want to further think, if that's looking outward, if you will, where this is looking inward, how do we nurture leaders? How do we begin to continue to nurture leaders? We want to look at the School of Architecture and say, okay, we have an architecture program, we have a master community development program. We have a digital media studies program. We want to find new and creative methods to engage the students there to nurture the future leaders that hopefully will be working alongside the leaders that are being nurtured throughout the communities today. So designers as leaders in the community, that is been, has always been the School of Architecture's goal, goal and the Design Center's goal. One thing we learned in this work is that the only thing predictable is unpredictability. And the design center has always found ways to be nimble and flexible. So that's the one thing that we want to keep constant. As Charles alluded to, we could be working with the stakeholder group and the whole stakeholder group saying, okay, this is the agenda that we're moving forward. And then one person suddenly gets to say, whoa, now that we've done this, I see this and it changes things and say, great, now let's change course, become nimble, and find ways to be creative around that, because that will make a stronger, stronger re a result. So in all in all, we love shaking things up, and we want to continue to shake things up, and we love shaking things up with partners. We love doing it with a variety of people. For all the architects in the room, there's almost every project we've done, except for some of the really tiny projects, we've always partnered. I was talking with Russell Baltimore earlier today, um, over a decade ago, um, Design Center, and he worked on a project, and we are constantly looking for partnerships, constantly finding that within architects, within urban designers, landscapes, with the community organization, businesses, and so on, but to do this, to shake things up. We're gonna end with a quick video. Process. Collaborative. Nimble. Innovative. Resourceful. Thoughtful. Creative. Human-centered. Scrappy. 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 I like scrappy. that. The office and how we work can be scrappy, if you will. Let me think of recycled materials. Reusing scrap. Maybe a vacant lot that people have only seen as blight. A lot of times around shoestring budgets or working with communities that don't have a lot of money. Working with, with little, very little resources and being able to come up with a, a great product. An asset versus something that's, that's negative. 
and helping build capacity. To become unique to the circumstance and connecting all those dots that people may not see connections with, suddenly now they're connected and create something that brings hopefulness and meaningfulness. And very rewarding when you see what can be done with that product. When she says scrappy, that's mm -hmm. what I think of. Every project and process is different. We don't have kind of a formula. Though we certainly have an engagement process, but it's, it changes with every project, and every, every project brings a fresh process and perspective. And the innovation comes in part from having the, the time and the space to explore these projects, to be resourceful and bring in other perspectives. Mm -hmm. and, talk with students and talk with community members and utilize existing and new resources and we're trying to alter practice that to me is part of the innovation one interesting tactic that i find was the detroit stories but where we went through and had a whole series of oral histories presented from detroit residents around the city on their love for the city of Detroit. We often forget the excitement and love that people have for Detroit because we are bombarded by a one-sided perception of the city. Having those stories was a wonderful way to sort of re-energize the passion. I think that's really exciting. I really like our process. And, and the fluidity and creativity that goes into just designing the process. Whether it's landscape architects, architects, urban designers, or plan planners are practicing altering that, that process as opposed to being an alternative. And it's so exciting. It's really interesting mm -hmm. how we start the projects um, and then they just fold and develop into what they do. And for the most part, they always seem to come together. We are all very, very different, but our values towards this kind of work is what unites us. What we do and with the thoughtfulness that we develop that process puts a, a particular sensitivity into each project that we do, I think. One of the projects I was going to mention, the process that we took with the Mexican town burner Bagley Vista, and throughout the process realizing that a lot of the stakeholders that we wanted to reach actually didn't feel comfortable coming to organized meetings. You know, having to respond to that and thinking of a different process to reach out to them. And when we use the notebooks in gathering places around the neighborhood to engage people that we couldn't reach through organized meetings. And I think that was very innovative, too. I would go to Cafe Con Leche to get my coffee. We went there, and Jordi would be like, are you keeping it here? Are you keeping it here? And I'd flip through the comment book and see mm -hmm. what people were saying. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was interesting that we're, while we are able to gather that information, other people are able to see what other people are saying mm -hmm. and, and can respond in that way. Like, he really enjoyed his customers being able to use it and... And so it almost felt like we were giving something to Jordy, too. So that was always nice. Tactics individually are great and wonderful, but it really meant the connection between all those tactics because that's where we were able to reach a variety of type of people that perhaps one tactic would not. The Livernoy storefront is a venue to help those conversations happen, and we're making the space for ongoing work. And I think that's where our innovation lies, isn't in the individual tactics, but how they all connect. All voices are heard and are part of the process because we use a variety of tactics. We have to be able to change kind of direction very quickly, so being flexible. It's like learning a dance. Certainly the community members teach us how to dance and <laughs> challenge us to be nimble. Learning how to be nimble has also come through the teaching. We're teaching in the center, we teach in the classroom, we teach in the studio. That keeps us nimble, it keeps us um, current, it keeps us, if you will, honest. You could argue that we're sort of set up what we don't know is an asset. And I think that also speaks to the authenticity of our process. Mm -hmm. And that just reminds me of a poem. Somebody said it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied, maybe it couldn't, but he'd be one who wouldn't say so until he tried. When we say we, we don't mean just we, the design center. We mean the we of the community, the businesses, the organizations we're working alongside, together developing the tactics and the methods. And that has grown out of this um, true collaboration. We don't have it all figured out and we're gonna work with you and we're gonna learn together as we go to address 
the community's needs. With that, we know we took a little longer than expected. Thank you very much. Thank you. What was that a year ago now, uh -huh. in January? Uh, you got a commitment from, was it Kresge? Uh, could you describe, the, I, I heard about the commitment. I was impressed, but I never heard the details of just how it is laid out. Certainly. When, uh, what Father Stoudemire is referring to is in, on January 9th of 2013, when we released the Detroit Future City book, the variety of people that worked on it released the book. One of the announcements that came through and was a bit abridged in the way the media covered it uh, was that Kresge was going to commit $150 million towards the work. What was said and what, that, what I just said was sort of the abridged version what was said was that Kresge is going to align all of its grant giving over the next five years that totals $150 million to align, they're going to align it with Detroit Future City. So what people began to hear is that all this money was going to go to the DGC or the Detroit Collaborative Design Center or, you know, CDAD or some other place and no money's going to none of the partners in this. It is um, going to organizations, going to um, the folks that would normally apply to, um, to Kresge, and actually other funders are, are, are uh, suggesting and going to be potentially doing the same thing, that connecting their giving to the framework. And that was essentially the, um, how that's being done. We are not in those dialogues, and I'm not sure how that, uh, but the, the mechanisms of that is, uh, but that was, the, that, that was the intention of the announcement. For those who couldn't hear in the back, what um, he was just saying is the commitment is for those who want to get stuff done and want Kresge money, you need to show how it relate to Detroit Future City. And the answer to that is yes. How, again, I'm not sure. That's, um, uh, we're not a part of that organization. They, they're setting up the guidelines to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, right there, sorry. Yeah, I have one more, I have a question. Obviously, the design center is based on design and your architects. And I've been very impressed with this presentation and following your work. Um, my question is, how much of this do you see as applying to uh, developing communities that just interpersonal communities? Not necessarily, oh, this is a vacant lot and look what we can do with it, but just building connections between people, even you know, movements within Detroit. How do you see that playing into what you're doing? I can begin that answer. You're welcome to chime in. It has everything to do with it, if you will. Uh, we are designers, and we feel that civic engagement and building things, making things, go hand in hand. At the same time, we're drawing from a, a, a large body of knowledge of civic engagement that is independent from what we do. And there are many partners that we've uh, that are here in the city. Rise Detroit. Uh, um, I've already mentioned CDAD, the Har Harriet Tubman Center, and a variety of people that do that in other ways. And we draw and connect that way as well. That build community, build relationships, and, and so, so we're taking that and hopefully being creative in new ways of of the tactics. But the vision of bringing people together 
and showing that leadership isn't, a, a leader in a community isn't convincing the community to follow that leader's vision. It's actually working together and the community, the leaders of a community begin to sort of um, draw the community together to um, face the future together, if you will. And so it's a very different, but it's, we're not, we've created things and we've, I think, invented within that framework, but we're drawing from a body of knowledge of civic engagement and then directing it con specifically to the design professions. We, I would say that we've been in interacting with so many of different departments. So the, in, the, in recent years, the housing authority, we have not only through um, um, Detroit Works we have, but there's actually been a conversation I just had literally two, three months ago about how do we actually come together in new ways to get there. Um, we work specifically um, hand in hand with, uh, with the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, which is different than what you're asking, but that's where a lot of our partnerships have been and have worked, uh, have, have come together. Um, but throughout, uh, one thing that we, uh, we've tried to do and have been able to do is within the, the uh, whether they're quasi-governmental or governmental departments, we've been able to bring people to the table way before Detroit uh, works. One of the things we were working with was the Detroit Office of Foreclosure Prevention and Response, where monthly meetings of all the departments that were governmental and quasi-governmental came together to work through a series of ideas that we facilitated through. So we love to work with the individual agencies, but we also want to connect them as we, um, I think we probably overuse that word, but, but that we truly believe that's where the innovation will lie, because agency A has criteria and, re and regulations, agency B has different criteria and regulations. We have a vision, that agency has the same vision, but their criteria may not get them there. This agency may have the same vision, but their criteria and regulations may not get us there. And so together by working, we can actually find how to adjust all of those to get us to that vision. Did I see another hand up? Yes. Actually, there's a microphone coming. Hi. Um, yes, I'm curious. Um, it, it seems like you, a lot of your work is drawing, um, is based on working with the existing assets of Detroit. And I'm curious about how your approach is towards drawing in, you know, new industries, new populations from outside of Detroit to sort of fill it in. I don't need to be the only one answering. I'm happy to answer that. Do you want? Okay. <laughs> um, we truly believe that we have to engage inside and outside. The tenor for, um, uh, of a lot of the work that's happened within the city has been outside folks coming in and trying to say what should happen in the city of Detroit. That for obvious reasons because of the way the media has portrayed things that have been going on is, has been the case. There's, as I hope we've alluded to, incredible things happening. But now, what we truly believe, if we're creating that, pl uh, that environment where entities are working together and talking together, those entities don't have to only be Detroit-based entities, they could be a variety, of, but, there, but there's an equitable dialogue. That's what we're looking for. A lot of the work that was happening with Detroit Works was specifically done to celebrate the Detroiter, the Detroit business, the Detroit organizations, for all those reasons, to make sure that folks could see that it was built from the assets of Detroit. At the same time, we have to think as a region, and we have to think beyond the region, 
and, but we need to do that equitably. So that was the, the purpose of part, why we sort of always default to a Detroit dialogue and then say, let's get to that point where there's a respect and trust and then we can have a, so we'd love to bring in other folks, other pieces into that dialogue. It's about, but it's about creating a dialogue where people are all, as the title, more programs, more, actually I should have ended with that and thank you and I'm gonna over answer your question, I apologize. But the, we don't think that when we talk about more people, we mean more. We're not trying to shift the lens away from X and Y to um, you know, A and B. We're trying to widen the lens so more people are included, more programs. That a homeless center that we showed, the, the St. Joseph Rebuild Center, actually won that, Ur that Rudy Bruner Prize, Rudy Bruner Award. It won an Urban Excellence Award and tied with Millennium Park in Chicago. People are saying, well, didn't you wish you won and didn't? I said, no, I love that. Because I love that we can show that a homeless center and Millennium Park are both programs that we should be designing excellence for. Both geographies that we should be thinking for and the people that are part of it, all of those are, are part of that. So more than you probably wanted to know, but that was sort of like expanding that, just saying that really we need to bring that dialogue into an equitable condition here. I again thank you. I really want to thank all the students who came, um, carpooled to make it here. Thank you very much. But I, of course, we thank all of you for being here. We would, um, uh, again, would like to meet you out there at the exhibit if anyone has questions about what you see up there. We thank you very much again. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and hopefully we will partner or engage in other ways in the future. Thanks.